Hey everybody, happy Torch Thursday tutorial. Sorry I'm a little late. I had some camera issues, but I am here to do all of the things for you all tonight. This is a in every tool in the shed, every technique in the arsenal tutorial tonight. So we are going to be stamping, not stamping. That's the one thing we're not going to be doing. We're going to be sawing. We're going to be engraving. We're going to be soldering. Um, it's going to be loads of fun. And um, let's talk about what do we need to accomplish all of this cool stuff. For starters, we need to figure out where we put our silver sheet. Oh, sheet. So, um, you're going to need some sterling silver sheet metal, and I've got some 22 gauge sterling silver sheet. You could also do this with 24 gauge. You are going to need some easy solder. This is not actually a, a very complicated soldering project. The soldering is only the end of the, focus on me please, camera. The soldering is only at the end of the project really where we put in the stone. So I've got some easy solder here. You are going to need... Um, a stone of your choice. I've got a reason I was so late is I was trying to get my camera to focus and I think it is focused. I just think there's too much light down there. Okay, so you're going to need a bezel cup and a cabochon that correspond in size to each other. So I've got a five millimeter um, little star sapphire and a five millimeter bezel cup. And then you're actually only going to need two um, four millimeter soldered rings, but I have a third one because I have a sneaking suspicion that I might melt one. Um, and as far as. Hi, Barb! I know you found us. We're late. We're, li we're little late tonight, but hi, promise Barb. we'll be fine. <laughs> Heather says hi. Um, hi so as far as tools go, this is, this is an all tools on deck scenario here, okay? You're gonna be sawing. So we're gonna need a jeweler saw with a two-out saw blade, and we're gonna need a bench pin. We're gonna need a dapping block and dapping punches. You're gonna need sandpaper, you're gonna need steel wool, plus all of your soldering things that's your torch, your soldering board, flux, pickle, and a pickle pot and uh, tweezers for holding hot things and probably about 10 different things that I've forgotten about and I will tell you what those are when I remember what I have forgotten but for now we're gonna start by making ourselves a little template for our pendant so I really can't draw to save my life so I am a fan of using um, assistant devices so I'm going to start with a circle template and I'm going to draw on just, this is just a piece of paper, I'm going to draw a circle. So this is to make that, that crocus shape that you see in our project sample. So I've got my circle, now I'm going to take a ruler and I'm going to divide my circle into quarters and I am, I, I could use a protractor but I'm just going to eyeball this. And this, I will say, is why I love these graphing style rulers because first of all, they're transparent so you can see through them. Second of all, I can line my one line up with, with the line on my ruler and so I, even though I didn't manage to perfectly, um, hey! You know what, Lori? You're actually just catching the beginning of the tutorial because I was having camera issues and I just started. So good, good, good job. Timing. Good timing. Also, French toast and bacon. I am so hungry. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, right? I didn't really get to eat my actual lunch today. Okay, so that that's my second. So this line was a little too high, so I just drew a second line that's a little bit below it. Also, <coughs> here's another one. <coughs> okay, sneeze is out of the way. So now I'm going, thank you. So now I'm just going to kind of freehand this shape. And so the way that 
that this pattern kind of works in my in my head is there are four petals that are kind of on the top and then there are four petals that are kind of underneath um, and once again those of you who actually have talent at drawing please don't judge my my poor drawing skills because you know we we do the best we can with what we have I have gifts and drawing is not one of them but so there are my there are my four petals and those are the ones that I'm actually going to engrave um, and then I've got oh yeah speaking of tools that I forgot about I'll talk about gravers in just a second Okay, so that's my basic template. That's what I'm going to use to cut out my metal. Um, and there are definitely two important tools that I forgot. Number one is a prong pusher. We've used this tool before. This is what I'm going to use to set my stone. But number two is a graver. Okay, this is what you use to engrave metal. Basically, it is a sharpened. Um, it's, a, it's a piece of, of, you know, rectangle stock that's been ground down, okay, it's been ground down and this point right here is sharp and that's what you actually use to engrave metal. These come in lots of different shapes. I think this one is called an onglet, but I could be wrong. Um, it, you know, it's just pretty much your most basic graver that you can possibly get. So now I'm going to throw something, I think. No throws. Okay, so now I'm just going to take a moment and I'm going to just roughly cut out my template because I'm going to apply it to my metal that I'm going to saw so I don't need this whole piece of paper. Okay, so that's my little template. Now, if I decided I wanted to mass produce these, I wanted to do multiples of these, um, I could very easily either scan this into my computer um, or make multiple photocopies of this so that I could replicate this again and again and again. But for now, we're just going to do a one-off. So we're going to take our sterling silver sheet metal. And we're going to take some rubber cement. Okay, this is just your regular Elmer's rubber cement. There's nothing special or fancy about this. Rubber cement is one of the best media for gluing uh, templates down onto metal because it will allow you to peel the template off the metal without any um, weird residue being left on your metal. So I'm going to find the most efficient place possible to put my template, which I think is in this corner right here. Um, this isn't necessarily going to interfere with my shape at all. So I'm going to take my rubber cement, and you don't want to put a massive amount on the back of your paper so don't like drown it in rubber cement but you just want to give it a nice coating of rubber cement you can enjoy that lovely rubber cement fragrance taking you back to the days of your youth and then we're gonna flip that over and we're gonna put that down on our metal and go as close to the edge as you can because that's gonna you know conserve as much metal as possible and then you just want to um, go ahead and grab a burnisher if you have it or some other sort of device to just burnish that down onto your metal and that's just going to make it as easy as possible to cut because um, if you don't burnish it sometimes your rubber cement doesn't adhere and then you've got just kind of squirrely metal. You also want to give it a solid um, one to two minutes to dry before you try and cut on it otherwise once again it's just going to keep shifting and shifting around while i'm waiting for my rubber cement to dry i'm going to take my bench pin so i do not have a permanent jeweler's bench i bounce back and forth between my streaming area and um, our work table here at beating dreams but i don't have a bench permanently set up that i work at so um, I love these clamp-on bench pins. They, they are easy to move around to multiple work areas. So they come with this little clamp, which does, you can take it out, which makes for easier storage, especially if you are 
a bead store like us where you've got like 15 of these, you can just kind of stack them up. Um, but to clamp it on, you're just gonna put your little clamp back in. And then this is gonna go on my table right here in front of me. And I'm just going to loosen it up, put it on my table, and then I'm gonna tighten it as much as I can. So that's my bench pin right there. And this bench pin doesn't love this table, so I'm gonna tighten it up as much as I possibly can. So that's gonna be my surface that I'm gonna use for sawing. And the reason that this is a, an optimal surface for sawing is because you can support your metal from both sides. Now, in order to saw, of course, you need a saw. This is a jeweler saw. Um, and this is a two-aught saw blade, which is kind of a medium-small size of saw blades. And in order for this to work, saw blades are like um, guitar strings, violin strings. They don't work well unless there's tension on them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my saw frame and I'm going to just push it against my table and I'm going to lean into it. So see how that compresses my saw frame and it makes my blade bow. So I just want to move my blade up so that I'm compressing my saw frame and it's straight. Then I'm going to tighten the top nut of my saw frame. I'm going to let it go and what should happen is when I flick it, ooh that sounded weird, and you want a nice high pitched pinging sound. So. That's what you want, okay? That noise. That's the sound of a, of a properly loaded saw blade. So now my rubber cement should have dried. So now I'm ready to saw. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut out around all of these outside lines. So I'm going to cut here, 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 etc., etc. So the circle is irrelevant. That was just for, I have no idea what note that is, Lori. Um, anybody who has a pitch pipe is welcome to figure that out. All I have to say is it's the note of a well-loaded saw frame. Um, so the circle is irrelevant. That was just for purposes of crafting my template. And these lines here from here to here here to here, here to here, here to here, etc. Those are not cutting lines. Those are the lines that I'm gonna um, be engraving on. So, so basically what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna cut all of the outside lines of this piece. So I'm gonna take my saw frame. Oh, but first of all, I'm gonna take my shears and I'm gonna excise this piece from my larger piece of metal. The reason for that is when you're working on a big ass piece of metal like that, Sometimes your saw gets trapped in a corner where it can't move. So just, you know, dealing with the smallest piece of metal possible is going to make your sawing a little bit easier. So I'm going to take my saw and I'm just going to pick a place to start. And starting your saw is usually the hardest part. So I'm just going to real gently drag that down my metal until I've got it started and then I'm just going to start sawing out my shape. Now a couple things about proper sawing technique um, and it's different for everybody you got to find of course what works for you but through many years of teaching sawing to students a couple of things that, that are mostly consistent for most people number one don't hold your saw frame like you're gonna beat somebody to death with it, okay? Even if you're so frustrated that you wanna beat somebody to death, don't hold your saw frame like you're trying to beat somebody to death, okay? So what you wanna do is you wanna hold your saw frame lightly. And usually I'll hold mine with two fingers, my index finger and my thumb, and then my other fingers just basically serve as kind of a, a balance point for my saw frame. Number two, um, it's helpful to think of your saw frame as only having one dimension of motion, which is up and down, kind of like the needle of a sewing machine. Um, if you think about pushing your saw frame forward, your, your blade's going to get bound up in your metal and you're going to wind up breaking a whole lot of blades. 
Last thing, and this is really something that beginning sawers tend to do, is you don't want to lead with the head of the saw. You want to keep it vertical. And if you have a tendency to lead with the head of the saw, what helped me when I was a beginner was thinking of leading with actually the handle of the saw. And that what, what that did is that just compensated for my tendency to lead with the head of the saw and brought everything back to a vertical. Um, now, saw blades break. It's a thing that happens. It's nothing that you should feel bad about or scared of. Um, but, you know, if you're breaking more than one to two blades per project, you may want to consider thinking about what might be happening in your technique that's causing those blades to break. Now, let's talk about turning corners. Okay, as I'm at one right now, so what I'm going to do is I'm kind of treading water with my saw blade and I'm turning my metal and when I get to the point where my saw can go forward again then I'm going to go forward again. Um, and let's also talk about speed with your saw blade, okay? Um, when you're sawing, if you want to go fast, the key to going fast is using all of your blade, okay? And and a lot of beginning sawers will just kind of saw like this, just using like a half an inch of their blade. And and if that's what you need to do to get the technique down, that's totally fine. That's absolutely fine. That's not a problem. But if you're looking to increase your speed, the more of your blade you use, the faster you're gonna go. And again, that has nothing to do with pushing your saw blade forward. It's just about the more of the cutting surface you use, the faster you're going to get to the end of your project. So I'm just going to keep sawing. I think I'm going to go off the edge there. Alright, so I've sawn off part of this. Now I'm going to go ahead and continue on. So I did a really good job of efficient use of metal because I sawed myself right off the edge there. So I'm just going to keep sawing until I've got this whole thing sawn out. Um, so a lot of people have a problematic relationship with the jeweler saw, and I can totally sympathize because it can be a very, very frustrating tool. Um, it can be one of those tools where it makes you feel really out of control of the process. But once, once you get comfortable with your saw and realize that actually the saw gives you, in fact, more control over the process rather than less, um, it's a really empowering tool to know how to use because you can do so much with it. I can cut out a shape like this that's got detail from the outside. I can also you know, pierce from the end cut details from the inside, which is something that you can't do with um, a shears. And it, you can cut so many more precise details with a saw than you can with a shears. And Heather has corroborated my view that saws are awesome, but I realized that it's like you know, saws are the prickly friend that takes a while to, you know, get to know and love. I'm not even good at them, but I still recognize <laughs> how amazing they are. I mean, they're like the literal prickly friend. But um, once once you form a good relationship with your saw, trust me, you will never look back. The only reason I don't do more sawing tutorials is because... Um, up until now, it's been really hard to get my camera to focus on my saw, but whatever I've done recently with my camera setup seems to be working out well. So there may be more sawing tutorials in the future. Because I do love my saw, I really do. Alright, we're almost done. Now, here's one thing safety-wise. So, when you're holding your sawing piece over your bench pin. You're going to put it over the V slot. You want to support it from both sides. Um, and sometimes that actually means 
you know, one hand it, or one finger in front and one finger behind the blade. Um, there are no teeth on this back side of the blade, so it's not going to cut you. But you need to be aware that when you reach the end of your cut, your saw blade is going to jump forward. And so when you're coming to the end of the cut, you do not want your finger in front of the blade. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep my, I'm going to reach one through the blade and one on the other side so that there's no flesh in front of that blade because what's going to happen and you'll probably be able to see it on the camera is when I get to the end here see how it jumped because it abruptly had no resistance to it now you know if if it just jumps forward like that's not a big deal like I can hit my finger with this saw blade all day and it's not going to do anything the problem is when it jumps forward and you're in a downstroke that's the way the teeth cut um, and yes that is why I had a te tetanus booster um, seven years ago was because I sawed the hell out of my left index finger so just be careful when you're coming to the end of a cut because your saw blade at that point is going to leap forward rather aggressively and it's better not to have your um, you know fingery parts in front of it okay so now I'm done sawing so I can put my bench pin to the side I'm gonna grab my bench block all right and we're gonna take a look at what oh goodness well nobody said that you could like do that camera there we go okay so now we're gonna take a look at what I actually sawed out and before I take my template off I am gonna go ahead and just real quick draw my crossbars so that I can kind of replicate my template design on my metal and then I can take my template and just peel it off and again this is why rubber cement is so awesome is it will literally just peel right off your metal and there's there's nothing left on your metal there's no gook there's no gunk there's there's nothing that's nasty which is awesome I was gonna throw that in my trash can but then I remember that I knocked it over a few minutes ago so now I'm gonna try and recreate my pattern on my metal and um, now you could totally transfer this like with a graver or a punch if you wanted to I'm I'm a little more fly by the seat of my pants with this project so I'm just sort of re redrawing it and drawing it and that's gonna give me a template for my engraving Okay, so now this is where we're going to take our graver. So once again, a graver is it's a piece of rectangle stock that's been ground down and then it's got a sharp point there. So what it does is, is it literally, you know, peels up the metal to make a groove. And people who are way more advanced at engraving than I, of course, can hand engrave all kinds of cool things. I'm still a beginner engraver, so I'm sticking to lines. Okay, lines are where I'm at. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make some lines. So if if we look at if we look at this, if we look at my drawing on here, you know, you can see the the idea of you know four petals on top, four petals underneath. You know, if you turn this over, it just kind of looks like a blob. So engraving, just knowing how to do the, the simplest of, like, I'm not talking about you're going to engrave like your great great grandmama's initials on something. No, just knowing the simplest of engraving techniques gives you just another tool in that toolbox when you're making metal pieces and you're, you're creating the illusion of dimension where in fact there is none. Uh, which is what I'm doing here. Now you, I mean, you could actually, you know, you could cut all these pieces separately and solder them together and then you wouldn't have to create the illusion of dimension because there would be actual dimension. But sometimes it's nice 
to be able, like I said, to create the illusion of dimension even though there isn't actually any dimension there. So, when you're using your graver, you want to put the handle in the palm of your hand. And this is like sawing. You don't want to press too hard. You're just going to um, set your graver on your metal and you're going to just press a little bit and follow the line. Neat. And so what that's going to do is, you may, or may not be able to see, but there, see that? See that little, little glint there? That's a line that I have engraved into the surface of my metal. And since these are the definition lines for the petals, I'm going to go ahead and do each of them a couple, three times so that they're a little bit wider. So I'm kind of trying to, wider and deeper. So I'm kind of trying to follow basically the same track just to get a really nice defined line for the border of that petal. Okay, so there is, right there, there's my first engraved line. Hi, Corvus! Okay, so now I'm gonna repeat for the rest of my lines. And I find it easier to uh, grave from the inside out, but if you wanna go from the outside in, I don't think there's any, um, like right or wrong way to do that. Now that being said, I, nobody trained me to do this. I learned how to do this from uh, watching a couple internet videos and screwing around on my own. So, you know, please don't anybody like report me to the Master Engravers Guild of the World as being a complete hack, but, um, I think my, my point in showing you all this is that this is a, um, a really great tool and you can do massively complicated things with it, but you can also do very simple and effective things with it. And that's the, that's where I'm living right now is the simple and effective place. So, um, though it does, um, and Lori's learning to, um, carve leather by trial and error does sort of bring this to the forefront of my mind is if you're trying to to teach yourself to engrave um maybe don't start on sterling silver i started on copper and i started with just you know scrap like Lori just said i started with scrap pieces of copper and just sort of practiced on them because it took quite a while for me to get the right amount of pressure with the graver because for a while I was pressing too hard and it, it just gets, when you do that, it just gets stuck. It doesn't move. Um, and also it, you tend to get choppy lines if you press too hard because, at least in my experience, because you get stuck and then all of a sudden you get like da -da -da, unstuck. And so um, you, you can't get a smooth line if you're pressing too hard because you keep getting bound up in the metal, um, but if you don't press hard enough, of course you don't get much of a line, and it's not exactly the easiest thing to go back over the line again and again, so you got to find that happy medium of not pressing too hard, but pressing hard enough. Alright, I'm on my last um, pedal definition line. Um, and again, on these petal definition lines, I'm going over them, you know, for, I said three or four times, it's actually more like four or five times what I'm doing, just because I want them to be extra defined. And then when I go to my petal texture, which I'm going to start in just a minute, that's going to be like, a, you know, only once over each line. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and add um, the texture to my petals. So I'm going to start by doing one line straight up the middle. And then I'm just going to curve lines outward from the middle to the edge. Also, my left arm is getting tired. But, so just curve lines from the middle to the edge. 
So basically what I'm doing is I'm just trying to create the texture on this to look like a petal. So I'm taking lines and I started with my straight one in the center and then I'm just doing curved lines that are just going outwards from there and you can so there you go you can kind of see those there and I'm just going to do that on all four of the petals that I've defined that are going to be my on top petals and especially when you're doing curves don't press too hard obviously you need to move the metal or you're not you know doing anything with your graver but like the harder you press honestly the harder it is to make these curved lines okay so that's one petal mm. focus is a problem tonight um, but there is there you go, there's one petal you can see how it's got the texture on it. Now we're going to go to the next one. So I'm going to go once again and start with one line just straight up the middle. And then I'm going to do curved lines from the middle out to the edge. Like so. And then the same on the other side. If you feel like your lines are a little sparse, you can go back. You can fill in a few more. All right, move to my next one. So engraving is really fun. I think. So again, one line up the middle, and then. side um, the other thing about engraving that you do have to be careful of is there's no eraser um, so I, I screwed that one up right there you can see look at that line that's going straight across there that was not intentional okay that doesn't really fit so with my with my pedal so the best you can really do when engraving something like this is you can just kind of add more lines to sort of distract from your screw up line, but there there is no there's no eraser here. Once it's in the metal, it's in the metal, which is why, as Lori said, before you you know before you get your sterling silver out, it's always good to practice on scratch pieces like copper or brass something that's not very expensive all right so I have completed my engraving on this piece and I feel like if I try and refocus my camera, things are not going to go well for me, but I really want you to see how cool this is. So we're going to try it. This is my focusing camera face, in case anyone was wondering. Ha! 
<laughs> no, it didn't freeze, Corvus. I'm just, I want to show you guys how cool this looks, and my camera's not focusing in on it to my satisfaction. But no, no frozen, no crashing, thanks to Ace. He fixed all the crashy thingies. Oh, look. Yeah, you can see it. Yay. Okay, so that's all That's all my engraving right there. Okay, so so that's... So right now it just looks... and Okay, so there are some errors. There's one there for sure. Um, but all in all, like it, it just adds a nice textural element. And... Um, and I, once again, an idea of dimension where none actually exists. So now I'm going to give this some actual dimension by dapping it. Okay, so for anybody who's not familiar with dapping, dapping is where you take a steel block like this that has a bunch of different size depressions in it. And then you take a gelato container of punches like this. I'm just kidding, the, the punches don't actually come in a gelato container, but I have, I learned from an amazing metal artist, Q Fom Gray, that the best way to store dapping punches is in a gelato container. It's one of the many brilliant lessons I learned from that brilliant woman. So, when you're dapping, you're going to find um, the smallest depression that your piece will drop all the way into, which I'm going to go with because see, this one doesn't quite drop all the way in. So I'm going to go with this one, drop it in there, and then you want to find the punch that corresponds to the size of your depression, um, which for me is going to be this one. This is the biggest punch I have. You need to make sure that your punch is not bigger than your depression. So for instance, that is an okay fit. That not so much. Um, that is why a lot, I was blessed to receive a gift of a set of dapping punches from a former student because all of my other dapping punches have been completely um, scarred by students using them in the wrong size holes. So I'm going to drop my, is that the one I decided on? No, that's the one I decided on. I drop my piece into the depression in my dapping block and I want to make this um, pendant concave so I'm going to put the textured side up if I wanted to make it convex I put the textured side down so I'm going to put that in there and I'm going to put my punch in there and then I'm going to grab myself um, a household hammer or in this case my um, lovely and wonderful brass mallet And I'm just going to put the punch in there on top of my piece, and I'm going to whack it with the mallet. And what that's going to do is it's going to make my piece curved. So dapping is really fun, um, and I love making curved pieces. It's one of my favorite things to do, like things that are curved. Getting the punch back into the gelato container, always a bit of a challenge. It's like you came out of there, why will you not go back in there? There we go. Okay, so then that's the end of me and my dapping punch. Every tool in the dang world, but only for five seconds. Now I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to do a little bit of finishing on the edge of my piece. Because where I sawed here, is it's pretty rough. Alright, it's, it's not really nice edges going on here. So I'm just going to take some 320 grit sandpaper. And I'm just going to hit all of the edges with my sandpaper. I know, Corvus, if only we could eat and work at the same time, that would be so awesome.
Alright, and then I'm going to take a quick hit on just all of the points as well. Hi, Skinny! How are you? We started super late, so you're not actually as uh, late as you think. And then once I have um, sandpapered all around, then I'm going to take my steel wool and I'm just going to steel wool all my edges. And ideally what that's going to do is it's going to give me uh, a pendant that doesn't feel like it's going to, you know, completely uh, lacerate the wearer. Ooh, how was Doctor Strange? No spoilers, I'm just looking for an opinion. Alright, so that's my engraved pendant. Now I'm ready to solder. And, ooh, that's, that's not a rousing endorsement. So that's good to know. I mean, was it worth the price of admission or was it a wait for streaming kind of movie? Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and we're going to solder our bezel cup onto our pendant. And once again, I'm going to be using Easy Solder for this. So maybe I should get the Easy Solder instead of the Medium Solder. If you go alone... Wait, what does that mean, Amy? I feel like I missed a joke there. So I'm going to wind up needing three pieces of my Easy Solder. Maybe we shouldn't go with lathe. <laughs> well, that's fair. One for the bezel cup, two for the rings on the back of the pendant. So I'm cutting myself three pieces of Easy Solder. Was it worth the price of a ticket if you go alone? So if, there, if there's two, so it's worth the price of one movie ticket, but it's not worth the price of two movie tickets, is what you're saying? Or That's, did it have to do with your specific com company? <laughs> there are questions. Okay, so I'm going to take my flux, and I'm going to flux the center of my little flower. Um, no, it's um, exclamation point S safety, Lori. Um, so what flux is, what I just put on this pendant is what's called flux. Flux is a chemical that creates a barrier um, that prevents your metal from oxidizing. That's what allows your soldering actually to um, happen and take place. Also before you solder, definitely do uh, consult my um, five point soldering safety video which um, Lori just linked us to into the Twitch chat. Thank you, Lori. Um, you know, just a couple of quick tips for making your home workspace safe or safer and also for um, being safe when working in a community workspace. And I do want to reiterate that if you're in a community workspace and somebody who is in charge um, reprimands you or tells you uh, instructs you to change the way you're doing something, you should do that. Um, just a reminder that the people who run these spaces are not about busting your balls, for lack of a better word. They're all about keeping everybody in the workspace safe at all times. You know, it's, it's all great until it's not. You know, it's all fabulous until somebody lights their hair on fire. And no, that's not a metaphor. So, I also fluxed my bezel cup, the back of it, so I've got my bezel cup face down on my soldering surface and I've placed a piece of easy solder, oops, on, look, look, cords everywhere, must fix. Um, there's a piece of easy solder on top of the flux on top of my bezel cup. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sweat this solder onto my bezel cup. That means I'm going to turn on my torch and I'm going to heat that bezel cup until the solder flattens out. And sometimes your solder does what it just did, which is just kind of takes a dive off the edge, so just put it back. And you'll notice, you can see just from the, the extra heat, what happens to your flux under heat is, is it 
is it reacts. It will bubble and turn white and then turn clear. So I'm concentrating on my bezel cup right now. There we go. Okay, that's sweating your son of a... Mm. I just dropped my tweezers. <coughs> that's sweating your solder onto the back of your bezel cup. Um, so basically, I've melted my solder onto my bezel cup. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my bezel cup and I'm going to flip it over and I'm going to put it onto the piece that I have sawn and engraved. And I'm going to do my best to center it. Son of a son, right? There you go. Lori, Lori is keeping me PG before 9 p.m. Thank you, Lori. <laughs> okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to reheat this whole thing until the solder that I sweat onto the back of the basil cup reflows and bonds the two together. And you're going to be able to tell when that happens because that bezel cup is going to kind of settle out. So this back piece here, this flower, is a pretty big piece of metal so it's going to take a minute for everything to heat up to the point where your solder is going to flow. Concentrate your heat on the, the back piece, not necessarily the bezel cup, just because the bezel cup is pretty thin metal and it's going to want to melt. Okay, so that took a little bit of, of maneuvering, but there we go. Now my bezel cup is soldered onto my pendant piece. Yay! Okay, now I need to decide where I'm going to put my back loops. And so the way that this pendant is designed is it actually has two loops in the back that your chain goes through, and what that does is it prevents your pendant from kind of twisting and turning and dropping forward. So since I just eyeballed this, there's definitely going to be a spot, you know, a part that looks better to be the top and a part that looks better to be the bottom. So I feel like this, this is kind of the natural top of my pendant. And so where I'm going to put my rings is going to be on the back of that petal there and that petal there. So I'm going to flip it over and so I am a forgetful Francis so I'm just going to put a mark Wow! right there. What? Just forgetful Francis. <clears throat> well, you know, I make things up. It I like it. So what I did is I just put a sharpie mark on one of the, the petals where I want to put my soldered ring and so then I know that this is the other one. Now you'll notice the black the, the black of my pendant is all back. No, the back of my pendant is all black and oxidized so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to just flux the heck out of that whole thing and then I'm going to take my two pieces of easy solder that remain and I'm going to put one at my sharpie mark and I'm going to put one at the approximate location of my sharpie mark but on the petal that's on its opposite side if that makes sense so like get this one you know this one in the center I'm not soldering anything onto and then this one over here is where my solder is going to go and once again I'm going to sweat my solder onto those petals and I'm going to have my tweezers in hand because the solder is going to want to kind of um, dance away and change locations with the heat. Once again, this is a big piece of metal, so it's, okay, so that one went, that one went, there we go. Solder sweat onto the back of our pieces. Now, last step, I'm going to take my um, sterling silver 
soldered rings. I'm using four millimeter soldered rings. You could use five millimeter soldered rings if you want it. I'm using soldered rings because that way I don't need to worry about where the joint is. I'm just taking my soldered rings and I am dipping them in my solder, in my flux, excuse me, not my solder, dipping them in my flux so that they get nice and fluxed. And then I'm going to have to do this one at a time. Now your angle that you want your soldered rings to go on at is you basically want your ring to be parallel to the center line of your pedal. Um, and ideally, actually, you want it to be on the center line of your pedal, but if, if it's a little off center, you just want it to be at that same angle. So I've got my ring and my tweezers, and I'm just going to heat everything. Now, your rings are super, super sensitive to heat, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a minute, I'm going to heat everything up first, and then when I get to the point where, see how that solder's kind of spreading and flowing, then I'm going to touch my ring to it heat everything, and there we go. One ring soldered on. Um, One so ring to solder them all. One ring to solder them all. Heather is not wrong. Now I'm going to go ahead and grab my second ring. Don't forget to dip it in flux. And then this one's going to go right there. Again, heat the whole thing, keep your ring away, away from it for the first little bit just because it's really easy to melt them. And then once your solder starts to flow, just go ahead and touch that ring to your piece. Let your solder flow and then let it go. And hopefully it goes without saying, first of all, they should be at the same angle. Mine are not. Look at that. Bad, Allison. No cookie. So we're going to go ahead and match the angle of this to the angle of the other one. Um, but what I was actually about to say before I realized that I had heinously screwed up the angle of the soldering job is don't point the torch at your fingers. You know why? because fire burns. Okay, so this is my whole piece all. So, um, um, they're not aligned to the north-south axis, Lori. Okay, so this is, this is one of those, like, I'm not a super precise person things. So, what I actually did for your notes is I aligned one ring, the first ring, um, as I think that was this one actually, to the center axis of the pedal. Since I eyeballed this thing, the central axis of this pedal is not on the same angle as this one. So I aligned my second ring to be um, on the, you know, kind of opposing angle to my first ring, if that makes sense. So, so it's neither, neither of your two, um, theories are correct because I did not create this shape precisely. I, you know, I created it organically. So into the pickle, it goes pickle for anybody who's not familiar is a weak acid solution that will clean off all of the crap from my piece so that I can polish it and make it pretty. Then I will set my stone and then we will be done with our project. So thank y'all so much for tuning in. Uh, yes, Lori, you are correct. Um, thanks so much for tuning in to the Torch Thursday stream this evening. I know we're a little late. <laughs> Essentially, yes. Um, I know we're a little late this evening, so thanks for hanging out with us a little um, bit past where our normal stream would go. Tomorrow night is um, Freeform Friday, and I, uh, I have promised the stream for Freeform Friday that I will do this project 
This was actually supposed to be our Torch Thursday project, uh, I believe, last week. And I had had a very exhausting week, and I didn't actually do the project. I just sat on stream and talked about being exhausted for an hour. So that project, excuse me, is going to be our Freeform Friday. That was our multiple um, tube set ring. Tube setting, another really great technique to know. So, um, yeah, so tune in for Freeform Friday tomorrow night at 6 p.m. So that's more of a demo than a tutorial. Um, but I will definitely walk you through the project as I do it. And then, of course, on Saturday, we are going to have our braided and knotted bracelet, which is a really fun project, followed by a live merchandise sale. So let's check on my piece in the pickle. Needs just another minute. Also, I need a paper towel, so be right back. Um, as far as how long are you supposed to pickle pieces, um, the answer that, that most jewelers will give you is until they are clean. And the fact is that that is a highly variable, excuse me, number, uh, depending on a couple of factors. Number one, how hot the pickle is. Um, I've got mine in a crock pot on high, um, and that's a good temperature. For, for your pickle with your pieces. Um, number two, how fresh your pickle is, meaning how, how long ago did you mix it? How many things have you pickled in it since you mixed it? The more things you pickle in your solution, the more free copper it will acquire and the um, less well it will work. You can tell your pickle is reaching the end of its lifespan when it starts to turn green or blue. That means that it's pretty much saturated at that point with copper ions and um, at that point you really should neutralize it with baking soda and just pour it into a jug. Sorry. <clears throat> pour it into a jug and once your jug is full, take it to your community's hazardous waste disposal. They will know how to properly dispose of your pickle. Pretty, pretty sure that there's flux on my cup. Ew. Also, really ew because the flux I use is borax based, which means it's poisonous, but I didn't actually like ingest a whole container of it, so I think I'm probably fine. Um, okay, so when your piece is fully pickled and clean, it will look like it will look mostly like this. So it, it'll be mostly kind of a really light white silver. Um, and now we are able to take our piece and buff it with steel wool so that we can now um, set our stone. Now if you would rather not spend the time and effort to buff with steel wool, you have another option. If you have access to a tumbler, you can tumble your piece. At this point, you can take your piece, throw it in the tumbler, let it tumble for a couple of days. I mean, you can probably let it tumble for like six or eight hours, but I always forget it's in there. So um, let, it let it tumble for a couple of days and Mm. Sorry, I'll let it tumble for a couple of days. Pull it out, it will be nice and shiny, and you won't have to do a darn thing. But if you don't have access to a tumbler or you don't have a couple of days to wait, you're going to take some quadruple zero steel wool and you are going to buff your piece. Okay, so, so this finish that's on here is called pickle white. And it's not actually a residue. It's not something that has to be cleaned off. What pickle white actually is, is a layer of fine silver particles that are left 
when your pickle strips away the oxidized copper bits on your piece and in order to make that shiny you have to um, buff your fine silver to lay your molecules down and that's what makes it shiny and pretty. Um, the best surface you're ever going to get though, surface finish, with steel wool is going to be this kind of satiny finish on the back and you see that it was pretty easy for me to achieve that on the back. I'm having some struggles on the front of this piece because it's just so textural. So this is one of those pieces that makes me really glad that I have a tumbler. Now, what I'm going to do with this piece after I'm done with the stream is I'm going to go ahead and put it in the tumbler and that's going to be after I've set the stone because I'm going to do that for you um, as my last thing on the stream tonight. It is not advisable to put something in the, in the tumbler after you've put a stone in it. Usually you will tumble first and then put the stone in. Um, I've chosen a stone that will withstand the tumbler, but once again, don't, don't ever put a stone that you care about into a tumbler or any kind of polishing device. It's just never a good idea. It's not going to turn out well for you and maybe the first time and the second time and the third time you get lucky, but there's going to be a time we're going to completely destroy a stone by putting it in the tumbler. Ask me how I know. Oh, wait, it's because I've done it. So, you know, I'm taking a risk setting my stone first and putting it in the tumbler. And I know I'm doing that. And that's just because of the fact that I want to show you guys how to finish this project on stream. But seriously, in your own workspace, if you have a tumbler, tumble first, then set your stone. Okay? Do not transpose those two steps or you eventually will wind up with rigors. Okay, so I'm going to take my stone, which is this, um, it's not a lab. What stone did I, no, I didn't destroy, well, okay, Corvus, that, it, I mean, confession time, I've, I've destroyed more than one stone in the tumbler. Um, you know, a turquoise, lapis, malachite, all bad choices, so definitely had a couple of those go south. Um, not a lab, but I've, I've destroyed some other stones as well. You know, it, it's just one of those things where when you pull it out and you, it looks like crap and you're like, wow, that was a bad choice. Why did I think that was a good choice? That was a terrible choice. But unfortunately, your brain doesn't realize it till after the fact. Okay, so I've got my stone and I'm going to go ahead and pop that into my setting. Um, my stone's opaque, so I didn't have to clean off um, the oxide from the inside of my setting. When I set that stone, I want to make sure that it is level and fully seated in my setting. Okay, so I want to make sure that it's level, that it's down in there as far as possible. Then I'm going to take my prong pusher, and so see right here how you, you can clearly see, even on the camera, how the, the bezel is not actually laying over the stone. So that's our job when we're setting the stone, is to take our prong pusher and to actually lay our bezel down against our stone. And I'm going to work kind of in opposition. So north and south, east and west. So I've got my stone rolled down on those four compass points and then I'm just going to start kind of going around and and this uh, is a little stabby not gonna lie so uh, ow also I'm trying to do this without like murdering my camera so so the pusher is just gonna bring my basil in and down against my stone also, apparently, my prong pusher is going to beat the crap out of my camera. Mm. That's a good question. Lori asked, could you epoxy a cabochon onto the flower if you didn't have access to a torch? And the answer is absolutely. You totally could. Um, especially with the, the convex, or sorry, concave nature. Of, of the piece like it's that's a really stable environment 
for an epoxy piece because number one, it's going to be really easy for you to epoxy it as long as you set your, your curved piece in like some rice or something to keep it upright. Your, your bezel, sorry, your stone's going to, you know, want to sit in the middle. And second, the design of the piece is going to protect your stone in the middle from a whole lot of, you know, extraneous wear and tear. So yeah, you absolutely could do that if you don't have access to a torch. Okay, so you're just going to keep going around and around until all of your little pointy bits are down. So I've got that one right there. And I think it might be done. Awesome! Alright, so that's it. That is our engraved crocus pendant. So once this is tumbled, our engraving is going to be a little more obvious. If you wanted to even make the engraving more um, obvious, you could take a patina, you could patina that and then polish off the rest of it so you would actually have little black lines where you engraved. Um, I will go ahead and I will um, tumble this up and then I'll post on uh, Discord and possibly social media as well the absolutely finished, finished product. But for now, that's our engraved crocus pendant. Thank you, Corvus. Yeah, this is a fun one. I really quite enjoy this. Also, you, it, <laughs> okay, it's stabby looking, but we filed the end, so it's not stabby stabby. This would be an amazing earring. Also, I had a client who asked if this could be a ring, and my answer to that is absolutely. That would be a really cool ring. You just need to solder a band onto it instead of your two rings on the back. So, thank you all so much for hanging out with me again for a little bit of overtime torch Thursday for our engraved crocus pendant. I'm Allison from Beating Dreams in Dallas, Texas. We will be back on this channel, twitch.tv forward slash beating dream tomorrow evening. Uh, for Freeform Friday at 6 p.m., that's going to be another torch project, our um, quadruple bezel set ring, um, which once again I didn't actually succeed in doing in its uh, scheduled time slot. Yes, so you can also, this is totally scalable because I started with, you know, my circle template. So, so if you want to easily scale it, instead of doing this one, which is what I started with, do this one or do this one like the the principle of the design is so simple you know how I know it's so simple because I can't draw or design for crap so it's like take a circle quarter the circle draw your four petals draw your intermediary petals wham bam you're done so yeah super easy to scale this design um, it, it's just all based on the size of the circle with which you begin. So, thanks so much for hanging out with us on Torch Thursday. Again, we'll be back on this channel, twitch.tv forward slash beating dream tomorrow at 6 p.m. for Freeform Friday. That's going to be another Torch class, our quadruple bezel set ring. And if you can't make it tomorrow night, we will also be back on Saturday at 6 p.m. with our braided and knotted bracelet using large whole pearls followed by a live merchandise sale. So, I'm going to have a great night. And I will see you all back on this channel, twitch.tv forward slash beating dream, tomorrow at 6 p.m. Central Time. Thanks, everyone. Bye.